Good morning, Adrian. It's so nice to see you today. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here with you. I feel like I'm beaming. Like I'm just, I was so looking forward to this. Um, I'm so excited. And before we get started, I want everyone to know who you are. That's a great place to kick things off. This is Adrian Callender. She's an artist and educator at the University of Arkansas, where I am currently a social work st master's student. Um, Adrian is cross appointed in the School of Arts and the Walton College of Business. And I'm really looking forward to exploring what that means and your personal work as an artist and everything in between and around that. Um, so thank you so much for being here. No, it's so special to be asked to, to talk about the things that interest you, you know, deeply. So thank you. So Adrian, where we usually get started um, is people's personal background and art interest. I think we grew up in a similar neck of the woods and I'd love to understand what your life was like there and how you got here. So it's, you know, in the last um, few years, I've really come to see the privilege of being raised in New York City, um, where there's an enormous amount of public fundings for access to the arts. And, um, you know, it's sort of like you don't realize you're a New Yorker until you leave New York. And I've been out of New York for more than 20 years, but there's still these levels where I think, wow, you know, I grew up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I grew up going to weird, strange bohemian performances on the Lower East Side. And my normal is not everybody's normal, um, but it, I think it set me up to be able to appreciate experience and engage with, um, with mu multiple disciplines within the arts. Um, but my, my focus has really, um, I want to say narrow, but that's not the right word. Uh, let's just call it a focus. Focus can be narrow, <laughs> enriching um, within the visual arts um, and specific uh, sub sub practices that have allowed me to um, justify entrepreneurial engagements as extensions of sculptural practices. Um, so I, you know, I think maybe uh, someone once uh, someone told me once they. Uh, they, they understand now, now that I am where I am, they understand my career path and that someone was a family member, I'll say, which meant that they were a little bit worried for a time. But, you know, I've, I've, I've owned a small business. I've, I've been an executive correspondent for the uh, Department of Agriculture. I've been a project manager for an art technology group, and I've been teaching for and in the university for 15 years, multiple universities. So I think at the end of the day, all, you bring all those things together and you realize, wow, you're probably a really good candidate for teaching at the intersection of art and entrepreneurship. <laughs> yeah, I've, I'm learning this as we go. And like, it is making sense to me. That's so cool. But also, like, I have so many questions. <laughs> Let's so, go. First, you mentioned graphic arts and you're speaking to a like super novice of like not, I don't know any of the technical things. What does it mean to be a graphic artist? So not graphic, but visual, visual. Oh, I'm art. sorry, visual. No, it's fine. It, I mean, graph, you know, there's a whole um, relationship between graphic design and visual art, obviously. And um, but visual art, meaning uh, what, what anybody might think of right off the bat. Um, I'm married to a painter. Uh, my mother's a painter. I um, was a history major who spent all her time in the sculpture studio when I was at Reed College. Um, ceramics, photo, these are sort of what we think of as traditionally the visual arts, printmaking, um, drawing. Um, for me, sculpture was really my home base within, within art, within visual art. Um, and uh, it has a history of being a really expansive um, area within visual art. So you have um, media arts sort of coming up out of expanded practices, performance art overlapping with theater and dance, of course, but sculpture being a space that made room for these expanded practices, which um, if they caught, they could then move, they then moved out of sculpture, traditionally at least, um, and began to stand up on their own. Um, participatory art is another one. These are, it's, Maybe another good way to explain why I have such an affinity for sculpture is that it um, it just has allowed me over the years to act in highly interdisciplinary ways without stepping out of art. So <laughs> I had a I had this great moment when I I was at um, I've been I've been educated a lot too. I seem to keep, I always like coming back to school, um, and obviously now I've built my life in school. But I was at the Maryland Institute College of Art for a post baccalaureate post baccalaureate degree after my undergrad. Um, and then I went from there to Rutgers University 
to their visual arts program. That's where I got my MFA. And one of my first weeks there, I was talking to a painter who's also a poet, it turns out, and has become a really great friend and has actually participated in the Momentary Project, which I know you want to talk about, yes. Rana Lebo. And I walked up to her one day, or I was walking with her, and I was like, you know, sculpture is everything. Everything is sculpture, right? Meaning that like everything fits under that umbrella. And she turned to me and she said, I thought, I thought poetry was everything. <laughs> and it was like, I was like, oh, not necessarily just the written word, but that the arts are engaged in the game of poetry. And by that, um, I mean the ability, the capacity and the interest um, in shifting people's perspectives. There's a shifting involved in the arts. You know, at the highest level, they create a shift in our understanding of who we are, of how the world operates, of what it could be. Um, so nobody has a, a claim on that. <laughs> That's oh shared God. across them all. It's a yeah. pretty long answer. Uh, no, this is fabulous. I think too that the the way you just framed it makes the tie into entrepreneurship so natural. Like mm -hmm. it just makes a lot of sense. Um, and so I'd love to go there with you, but I, I do have to comment on um, you mentioned something about maybe being a correspondent for like oh, yeah. the agricultural sector. Yeah. How did that happen? <laughs> well, I love to write too. It turns out writing is another one of my practices. I think I think if you sort of talk to any um, any artist, you'd find they have multiple practices. Um, we tend to have to box ourselves to, you know, um, but uh, writing has always been important to me. And one of my first jobs out of college was as an executive correspondent for the Department of Agriculture. And I could tell you all, I could tell you all about uh, animal plant safety inspection services, if you want to talk about that. Well, but uh, what I found was that that was like too regulated a kind of writing, but it was a, you know, you, you gather all the experience you can as you as you move up through your 20s and 30s um, and then you never know how it's gonna how it's gonna shake out or what the applications might be. I love that. that. Yeah, because I think like, as when you mentioned it and your love of writing, I was like, yeah, that is writing technically, but like, did you have creative freedom in it? Like, but I think that you found a way to frame it so that it was an input into what became this like vast pool of experience to pull from. Well, think about it. If you are an executive correspondent for the Department of Agriculture, you're getting, you have to develop uh, talking points for the vice president. You have to answer inquiries from the Senate and you have to respond to the general public who can have extremely random questions related to one of our favorites. We pin this on the wall. We shouldn't have pinned it on the wall because it comes in every year was how to sex a chicken, right? <laughs> Which is like, like, <laughs> I don't know if you sh should you <laughs> like and right. it turns out it has to do with how do you like figure out the gender of a chick so you've got people in the field farmers who need you know it's they're looking for for information and for resources that's your audience so i think it was really good training and learning how to speak and write to multiple multiple the, the chicken farmer is as important as the vice president if you're an executive course <laughs> Oh, that's so powerful. I love that. And I've got a, um, I think it's just helpful knowledge for anyone who's looking for a job at any point in their life, like broad in the pool, like that you will find applications for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you want to do it, if it kind of makes sense to you, or if you think I'll try it, you might as well. I mean, that's what I think. Um, there's this idea that somehow you can just go be an entrepreneur, but one of the best ways to be an entrepreneur is to go work for an established organization um, so that you understand the field that you're trying to innovate in, right? I mean, you have to understand the domain that you're that you're trying to, to impact um, and you should get as many jobs as you possibly can and as many excellent, you know, not just any job, but things that you think will, 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 will hone you. Yes, I am. Um, that especially um, is meaningful to me that you can be an entrepreneur or desire to be an entrepreneur and go to a corporate setting or any setting that's already established and you can hone that skill. I think you can also like be an entrepreneur within that space. There's like the intrapreneur, um, yeah. which is something that I, I had that I loved to, to claim of like, I'm thinking about tomorrow, like I'm here today, but I'm thinking about our tomorrow. And I, so I think this is a great segue to your socially engaged art and entrepreneurship and their intersections. Um, I was looking through some of your like publications and you had this phrase entrepreneurship in artwork formation. Mm. And that might be a fun place to start. Well, it wouldn't be fun place to start if we were going to read the abstract on that. It's a little, <laughs> a little bit, it's not exactly like dinner conversation, but I'm super excited about that content. 
And, um, oh, you know, I want to, I want to tell you seven things at once. Um, I think one of the things that's, that's really important to me about it's, this is both meta and also specific direct content on that article, um, is that, you know, there's, if I say art, most people, and I just mean like a general, general um, audience usually thinks of a painting. And then they usually think of the Mona Lisa or the scream. And when I say entrepreneurship to a general audience, almost everybody sees a dollar sign. And those are not fair representations of either space. Within entrepreneurship, there's um, two, two models that I find really interesting and transferable and applicable to an artist's experience. Um, this is the not the dinner party part of conversation part of it, but they are effectuation and, eman <laughs> effectuation and emancipation. And so in that space of, of that article, I was looking into effectual and emancipatory principles. And, you know, I was really seeing how they are manifest in what's known broadly as socially engaged art or uh, socially cooperative art. Um, and I was like, well, this is really interesting. If I were to talk about emancipation and effectuation um, in, as, as, and I didn't tell you I was talking about entrepreneurship theories, you would think I was talking about art. And so that's a really interesting moment, I think, when you can pull entrepreneurship away from one discipline and into another, yeah. right? Sometimes they cross over, but sometimes, you know, there's an argument to be made for why entrepreneurship might be a standalone uh, discipline. That's another conversation. But the meta that I wanted to say was that effectuation, um, if you can bear with me one more second, the meta is that effect, you can't, okay, good. <laughs> that effectuation says, looks, is, is a form of entrepreneurial action that, that gets you going with what you have, who you know, what you know right now, as opposed to the model where you're supposed to, you can't really progress until you get um, significant investment. Um, outside investment. Effectuation says, and is very much the way an artist lives, it's like, okay, I've got some paper, I've got a phone, and I'm, you know, I'm going to be okay. Let's get going. Let's see what we can do. I would say that um, my, my own sort of arrival at an understanding of this intersection of entrepreneurship and socially engaged art was a matter of just teaching and practicing, and then all of a sudden thinking, oh, this is interesting. Look what I have. How do they go together? You know, in itself, that scholarship was pretty effectual. How, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there's, the concepts are, are new to me in like the terms, but I'm trying to, to make sure I'm keeping track. So effect, effectuation is mm -hmm. when like, you're not hindered by what you don't have. It sounds like you're just kind of like acting with what you do. That is so well said. Um, <laughs> well, we're recording, <laughs> so I think I'm part, Honestly, Adrian, I'm so yeah. glad that it worked out. Yeah. Right. Um, and then the other, the flip side of that, was that the emancipatory? So, so um, the, 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 night, the neat little uh, trick that I played in that article was I took these two uh, and I combined them into set, and I looked at the seven principles of those two theories or models combined. So emancipation has a different set of principles, you know, things that were observed by researchers looking at entrepreneurial action. Um, and I just saw how they, how they, those two, you know, all together, grouped together, seven principles that I think are, I mean, if I, if I, if we had time just to talk about that and I, and you know, anyone listening to this as an artist would be like, well, yeah, well, yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're more concerned generally with, with building strategic alliances than we are with analyzing competitive threats. You know what I mean? Like no one, it's going to be hard to steal our ideas. Yes it's much more interesting to figure out who might be on the same page and how we can collaborate and work together and maybe form something interesting in the world. Uh, I feel like that's such a valuable mindset for someone in the, the business world too, that, oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the crossovers that you're talking about. But that was, a, that was a business entrepreneurship principle, right? So it is observed in business context. It's just that artists have a much higher propensity to think and act that way normally. So once you say that, right, you're like, well, okay, so why aren't these people hanging out together? How do we get them to hang out together, right? How do we get discipline, people in disciplines who are thinking similarly? That is, how do we bring those methods into interdisciplinary settings and then see what 
kind of happens, right? What, what the exponential growth could be, or growth may be a wrong word. I think it's an overplayed word. We're sort of drowning in growth. Do you know what I mean? But I think um, discovery would be a better way to say it. What can we discover if we put those two groups together in the same space? That's really a teaching obsession of mine. And um, I think you, you, again, have made an awesome segue. Um, really? Little okay. spider hug <laughs> seemed to, maybe yeah. not business and arts, but like there was a lot of different art happening in the same room and different thought processes. And you like, explained that this is an example of arts entrepreneurship. So maybe I'll pause there and see if you'd like to paint the picture of how that went down. Yeah, I think if we say an example of, then we don't limit what the outputs could be, just like we don't limit art to Mona Lisa, right? Or entrepreneurship to profit, right? It's, it can, those are parts of, of them. So if we say uh, it's an example of arts entrepreneurship, um, I just wanna be really clear that there's as much variety, I think, in the, at that intersection um, as there is um, within either art or entrepreneurship. So little sweater hug really, you know, it sends us on to a different kind of uh, conversation. Um, and maybe some background to that is to say that I was researching and publishing and teaching and thinking things through. And yet my practice was still uh, sculptural and not necessarily arts entrepreneurial the way I was defining it in the research space. So it had been on my mind to think through like, what is, what if I were to practice what I preach or practice what I'm observing, like, what does that look like? But that aside, Little Sweater Hug was very um, effectual. <laughs> you know what I mean? It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to apply these principles. It was spontaneous and whimsical. And um, I'll walk you through it. And we could even say, is it a case study for effectual and emancipatory principles? Yes. But we, won't, we, won't, we won't do that today. We won't, <laughs> we won't lecture today. Um, but Little Sweater Hug was this project. I actually don't have it here with me. Um, I might be able to, if yeah, that was a tab on your website, I can start the screen. Yeah, um, I'm in the entrepreneur, I'm in the arts entrepreneurship space. Do you want me to show, well, I'll show yeah, you later. I would love um, that too. Um, yeah, if you go to artwork. Yes, artwork. And this just one, to go to Kindred and Little Sweater Hut first, because this was, this wasn't even the beginning, but it was an early, um, moment of it it'll load so um almost a year ago it was april yeah let's see scroll down to because this is two projects in one at the baseball area arts center um at the end of the summer okay there perfect okay perfect perfect so um thank you thank you that was lovely driving <laughs> um Last April, I was, you know, COVID, right? I'm now fully vaccinated, but it, it was exactly one year later that this, you know, moment has come about. And um, so this time last year, I was moving my studio from campus back to the house. We were teaching remotely. We were just trying to hold on as we um, tried to understand the, the world we found ourselves in overnight. And um, in April, I had opened an old box, something I hadn't been in in a while, and I pulled out one of these little sweaters. There was only about two or three of them and they were slightly different. They weren't really, they were like that. They were a variation on that. And I pulled it out and I just, I, I held one like this and it just felt sweet to just, you know, we were so isolated from each other by early April. And, um, you know, if you were, if you were lucky, if you were privileged, you were in isolation, right? A lot of people didn't even get to be isolated. They were at risk all the time, but for the vast majority of us, we were isolated. And so when I held this little sweater to my chest, I was like, oh, it's sort of comforting, but it was so lighthearted. It was so whimsical. Um, nonetheless, I posted to Instagram and I just said, you know, if you need a little, if you need a hug, I knit one for you. And then, whoa, people wanted them. And I thought, okay. Um, so I started knitting them and I probably knit like, I don't know, hundreds of them. And I would send them out. First, I was driving across town and you can see up on the shelf or some of the images of hugs that people sent to me. Yeah. Um, and it was just like lighthearted later in August when I was in this really fortunate to be in this convening with Nick Cave and, and a small group of regional artists, he referred to it as a hotline. And I thought that was really a touching way to look at it. So, um, you know, this went on for about a month, five weeks. And then um, George Floyd was murdered. And the world changed again. It wasn't that it was a different world, but um, 
if you thought you were paying attention, you realize you hadn't been paying attention nearly, nearly enough. And so this project seemed very, it seemed insufficient to meeting any need on any level all of a sudden. Um, and so I put it away. And I spent a lot of time rethinking um, what, what it means to be a socially engaged artist, what it means to be an educator, what it means to be uh, in the arts. And um, I think a, a lot of people took time to self inventory, to ask, how am I hurting and how am I helping in the world? And I certainly was one was a person who went through that. Um, uh, I, I actually started thinking that last summer about just creating a stipend for artists who are in the community that I thought were feeling um, maybe not visible, right? I have this great um, institutional access. I'm in academia. I'm networked. I have all of these um, advantages. And so I started thinking um, June and July, how do I, how can I, how can I make, how can I share out those advantages? So very lightly without thinking, without putting any sort of, you know, actually I wasn't telling anybody I was doing it. Um, I started giving out modest stipends to people that I thought maybe could use a reminder that they are indeed artists and that making art, just making art matters. Um, and that, um, so I was sort of messing with the uh, sort of micro redistribution of wealth, like micro philanthropy, like what is that? What is that? And is that an art practice? Is that a socially engaged art practice? Just playing very gently with some ideas at the same time, trying to um, become a better human being, right? You know, work on, work on my, um, work on my, what do, what, what do I say? I mean, my blindness, my flaws, my, my complicities, my, all of it. Um, and then something really special happened in August, which, uh, which changed, which brought things into focus. So I think I'm, I'm talking too long all by myself without, without, without. I'm enjoying and I think okay. it's so valuable. And I just want to thank you for being like, like vulnerable and forthcoming. Like, I just think we're all in a phase of, I mean, constantly, hopefully we're recognizing ways that we can be better and we're doing it. But especially right now, I feel like we're, we're really in a moment of that and it's so important. And so to see you demonstrating like being transparent about it, it's, it's a great example. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we could fast forward but and then go back. I think we're also in this really, this moment where we could, we would might wanna so badly get out of the pain that we would skip it, right? And we'll just sort of take micro, micro progress and um, try to get back to some semblance of normal, which um, I don't ever wanna, I don't wanna ever wake up I want to. I want to stay. I don't want to be. It was so painful to realize that I was so wrong last summer, and I'd rather just continue to know where I'm wrong than to suddenly feel like I'm right again. <laughs> and then, you know what I mean? Like I think, uh, uh, you know, we're all implicated in in this moment. Um, so that's a bigger conversation. But I had this wonderful experience. Um, I had a letter from the momentary from Pia Agrawal at the momentary curator asking me if I wanted to join in a convening with Nick Cave, who's, whose work I admire so much. Um, and so we gathered in August to uh, talk about his upcoming show at the momentary until and he invited us about 15 of us to submit proposals to participate in response to that show. And so the momentary, um, you know, that that's how the little sweater hug came back online, really at the invitation of of Nick, I hadn't, um, you know, it was an eight hour Zoom where we all shared our work and I did not share a little sweater hug. I really had put it away. Um, and then when we came together at the end of the day, it was like eight hours of Zoom and then and then an hour of like coffee and cocktails and I was knitting and he said, Adrian, what are you working on? I was like, oh, <laughs> and I turned the camera to like what looked like I was crazy, right? But only crazy like an artist. I had hundreds of little sweaters that I'd been hugging, but not you know, just not doing anything with. And he, that's when he said he thought that back in April, um, I'd created a hotline with them and he wanted them to come into the show. So, so I updated and changed them. Um, one of the things that uh, he encouraged me to do was to put them in the shop. And up until then they had been free. They were really, it was a gift, a gift economy <laughs> um, up until that point. So I had to think through, um, I didn't want to make money off of them. That wasn't the spirit of, of, uh, I like to make money, but that's not what this project was about. Um, and so I took that impulse from the summer to just create informal stipends for artists who I think could use a, 
validation or a reminder that that just making art is is enough in itself. And I combine that with this invitation to to create a new limited edition um, in response to Nick's work um, until and then this opportunity to sell in the store and um, collaborating with a designer friend, an artist, a curator, a collector, an art historian. I mean, this is where the network becomes really, really helpful. I figured out that this could really um, generate income that would be meaningful to a small organization like the Open Mouth Reading Series. Um, and so the proceeds from the sale of the special, and you could go up to the top if you wanted to, the little sweater hug at the momentary. This was really a more performative extension of Little Sweater Hug in which I was in the, um, with, I sat within the um, exhibition on Thursdays for 10 weeks. And I was just uh, there for conversation to talk about reconciliation and reckoning and aspects of Nick Cave's show. And um, uh, if you go, you know what, if you go to thumbnails, do you see the thumbnail down at the bottom? You can sort of get a, it should be over and. Oh yeah, I was like, I don't know what, um... You see it or click on one image on one of these yeah oh Did it work thumbnails. yeah you see thumbnails yeah then you just sort of get a bigger sense of oh no maybe you're in it and it's just the the interface of zoom you're doing fine don't let me don't let me boss you around so i, um, I was like what's a thumbnail i'm really having quite a taste what, what i found was that the uh, the, the knitting made me very approachable. People would talk to me just about the knitting. It was an entry point. And I had been thinking really specifically about a woman named Mary Holden, who was part of um, a, a knitting activist group in Louisville, Kentucky, who was ca um, calling for justice for Breonna Taylor, who was also shot and killed um, not more, just about a year ago in Louisville by police breaking down her door in the middle of the night, um, African-American woman who has yet to really receive any justice. Um, and so uh, Mary Holden had sat on the Kentucky Attorney General's lawn with a justice for Brianna, little cardboard sign at her feet knitting and was arrested and charged. And um, I certainly was not experiencing that level of risk, um, but rather making a, a more um, a poetic reference, right? That idea of, can we create a shift in, in, in perspectives by, by bringing that element in? Um, into the performance, but it was a really, it turns out it, it, it makes you very approachable to just knit in public. And from there had amazing conversations with so many different people from different walks of life and, and situations. Um, and so the sweaters really are a, a mode of recording those conversations. Each sweater holds conversation um, in it. Uh, but the proceeds um, from that particular edition launched the Poet in Residency program for Open Mouth Reading Series uh, this January. So to me, that's an act of art, one kind of arts entrepreneurship, right? Um, the idea that art making might generate more art making, right? Or, or you know what I mean? There's sort of, um, there's aspects to it like that, but, uh, but it's, you know, that's just one manifestation. It was a really wonderful um, project to be a part of and, to sort of tie together some some of my investigations and um yeah I I should, you need not. one i need to get you a little sweater hug you need a little sweater hug. i'd cry like it would mean so much to <laughs> be so cool <laughs> um i see so i live near the two friends bookstore and they have yeah. a little sweater there and i was like i know her she's awesome like <laughs> you guys are so cool because you have the sweater so yeah. You know, I remember being a kid and selling, you know, lemonade and cakes at uh, the 76th Street entrance to Central Park. And I remember having my, old, my own business and selling things. And, that, and then I remember walking into two friends and seeing the little sweater hug on the wall. And it's the same thrill. Um, they're all the same thrill that you've, you've connected with people through some third thing whether it's, you know, a, a product or service, I would consider a lemonade stand a service, but, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it was, I was thrilled to walk in and see that the little sweater hug had taken on this life, right? That they've sort of moved out into the world. And, um, and that's really touching. I mean, I think that's, it's really touching. And I think it's so cool that like, 
you weren't even putting it forward. Like you were actually like actively withholding it and, and it still came forward. I am, I am rewatching Gilmore Girls right now. um, And I was listening to an interview from them from like years ago, probably, but the woman, Amy Sherman Palladino, I think was the creator of the show. And she was in a similar circumstance when she was pitching it. Like she was invited to this great pitch with this, these producers, you know, like whatever. And she had all these ideas and like, they didn't really like none of them really stuck but they were leaving the meeting and she had just come back from a weekend in Connecticut with her husband and she came up with this with this um this thing that had been inside of her because of these experiences that were really important to her she just yeah. um it just it's amazing what bubbles up because it has to like this had to happen we needed to see it um and it was inside of of your creativity and so I love that part of the story um you also mentioned that it was in response to to Nick Cave and I might be wrong, but the question he was asking was, is there like racism in heaven or something like that? What was the- Yeah, so this was, um, I'll back up and say one thing that um, that the the invitation to bring Little Sweater Hug back online, so to speak, and to, you know, to have Nick Cave, who's an African-American artist, invited in, in the summer of 2020, it, it really had me thinking about the difference between promotion and permission. And, and I think in that intersection of art and entrepreneurship, we can, we can look for permission or the invitation instead of trying to promote and push. And so without that, it, doesn't, it, it wouldn't have come back online. It had to be a very specific uh, invitation that, that, gave, that gave Little Sweater Hug, a, which is such a funny name, right? It's Little Sweater Hug. It was just a hashtag on, in April, but it caught. And so then that's that. But without that um, invitation, there wasn't the permission to bring it back. And it's an interesting mechanism if you think of an audience as as being receptive to what you have is essentially giving you permission to put something of yourself into their lives. I mean, why would we push, right? Why wouldn't we ask to be invited in um, on, under those circumstances? So the um, the, uh, the 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 sort of um, premise of gathering the convening with Nick Cave and also Bob Faust, who's his life partner and creative partner, who was also in, in dialogue with all of the artists and the curators, Lauren Haynes and, um, and Pia Agrawal. Uh, you, wanna, you wanna recognize everybody. I mean, I forgot to mention that the little sweater hug that was the special edition has a tag, an actual poem on- Don't worry, by I Rana forget Rana. <laughs> And Rana is like this person from 20 years ago in my life who said to me in passing in the first year of grad school, I thought everything was poetry. And look at that 20 years later. What an interesting little piece, right? Okay, so your question about the about the question. When, uh, when we were convened, we were asked to consider two things. One, one was to share our work, um, amazing group of artists in that cohort. Um, and the second was to consider the prompt that inspired Nick cave himself for the exhibition until which was he had sort of asked rhetorically is there racism in heaven Um, and if you know the work and if you know the show you can see how that question plays out in the works themselves but the other prompt that um that we were asked was to finish to finish the title until dot 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 how would you finish that sentence and so these were like really nice prompts to sort of play with as we thought about the until exhibition our own work and and how we might intersect Oh, what a powerful experience. Um, and so cool. I got so (laughs) fortunate. That was, that was so fortunate to be, to be invited to participate in that. Really great. And so I remember, um, reading that this work looked at reckoning and reconciliation, but I think there's a lot of just connectedness overall in the, the works that you've produced. And I'd love to take a look at a little bit further back in time to other things that you've created and, and how they maybe led to this point. Um, so yarns, um, Mm. was super cool and like material oriented as yeah. well as possibly my internet's not as quick as we are but it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um it'll come up I'm thinking when you when you think about yarns um so the first one is um my father passed away 15 years ago and his um his partner asked said please take take your dad take a shirt of your dad's she had lost her father and of course, I took them all, um, but uh, I took one apart. I took one of his Hawaiian shirts apart, and I just made it into what's considered rag yarn, um, and then I left it like that as a body. It's a textile art piece, but it's also, to me, a memorial, and then the other one that I think is 
it became a series. The, the other one that I think is deeply personal in this series is Karen's wedding dress. My good friend, the artist, uh, Karen Rodenborn gave me, um, her marriage ended and she had gone through mourning the loss of that marriage um, and gave me her wedding dress. And so I took that down into rag yarn. That's a tent we traveled in all summer, me and my husband and our, and our son, Amazing. twin beds. You know, so just like, you know, what's the, where's the um, story that can be told just through a fabric that's had a life of its own. So special. I love these ones. I'm um, glad you like those. They're, yes. Oh my gosh. Um, it was so exciting. That's a painting by Ron Olivo. No way. I took it apart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, wait, this one or the one on top? The one that's right there that we're seeing right now that's called painting. Um, you can't see because yeah, the title's reversed on it, but that's actually because we're not in the normal thumbnail view, right. the titles are sort of moving around. But the it, that one's actually called painting and it's um it's a deconstructed painting by she just gave me a painting and I took it apart. You gotta have permission to do that. You gotta yeah. make sure it's okay. that's a good permission example. <laughs> that's so cool. Um and then another one where I thought you there was really interesting to read it was the black and white. That was especially yeah. powerful to me too. Yeah, I think story is a really a, a really important element. You know, again, you don't just start out saying, "Oh, I'm going to be an artist, and this is the work I will make." You just you move through um, trying to get closer and closer to the pulses that resonate for you. And when I look back over twenty years of 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 art making, I find that story is a really strong thread, so to speak. So this piece was actually based off of, of um, photos from my parents' wedding. I've noticed over the years that my mother's eyes are often closed in photographs. And it is so, it is such a metaphor for some of the struggles that she's had in life and what it, what it means to be, you know, a woman um, who came of age in the 60s in the US and, um, was expected to conform to certain um, certain expectations in, a, in an age of revolution. And, um, you know, we'd like to all think that we were all right there with the revolution, right? But we all live in, in, in a, um, those gradations, right? There are gradations to that. Um, uh, I remember reading about Mad Men, the TV show, that people, you have to notice that in order to, to, to set the, what is it, the props, right? If the year is 1962, everything's not going to be from 1962. There's going to be stuff from 1948, 1957. There won't be anything from 63 because it hasn't happened yet. But that the present is really built of the past. Right. That when we look at any given moment, if we know how to read it, we can see the things that came before. So I think about this as something that came before me that informs me and who I am. Um, and it, it is accompanied by a, a long form interview with both of my parents. Um, from, from some time ago talking about the day of their wedding and they saw it differently. They saw it so differently <laughs> because they saw the world differently, right? Right. And, um, and eventually they divorced. Um, they stayed good friends all, all, all my life um, until my dad passed. But, you know, it's just important to, to me, it was important to unpack the story of my parents in order to understand my own story. And I was a history major, I should say. I was... <laughs> That helps a little. <laughs> I mean, it's it's you know somewhere between sculpture and history, uh, you'll you'll find me. That metaphor of like the you know creating like props for a shit that's gonna stick with me forever. <laughs> I think that's so valid. Um, and the like wisdom you spoke into like what your your mom's eyes being closed might suggest more broadly. Like these are such I, I said it before about like, like just powerful like images and sentiments and. Um, I'm really appreciative to get to, to be seeing them and hearing your story that goes with them. So thanks. Thank thanks. I'm so glad to be able to talk through some of them. And you know, what happens is you move on and you don't have the opportunity always to, to look back and think about some of the, the previous work. So it's a, it's a, it's a treat for me. Mm -hmm. Ah, this one, you want to talk about this one? Yes, I do. Um, and I think what you said about like reflecting too, I just will comment that it's so important, you know, in social work every week. And every week I hate it, but I know I'll care about it later. Like we have to write these journals and we like just pour out our soul of like every moment meant to us. But it actually, it makes the practice of an internship that like very artful. Like I feel like I'm getting so deep with myself. <laughs> the professor who reads them, like, I'm sorry that they have to go through this reckoning with me, but like, you're right. If that, you know, just let like half life, 
um, you know, happen without pausing to understand what's happening, we miss a lot of the meaning. So yeah, I think reflection is one of the best pedagogical tools. So in a lot of classwork, I teach a course called Creativity over in the College of Business and weekly reflections are one of the work products. Um, I think reflection, I mean, we have to, we have to take a minute to process things, right? Um, you're reminded, bringing this piece up, you have me thinking about something in a whole new way. You want to hear it? Yes. <laughs> um, that uh, when I was in college, I had a good friend who said, you know, if I hand you ABC, you never accept ABC. You're always like, well, C, B, F, D, A. And I thought, leave me alone. You know, <laughs> like, but that impulse to not just take what's given to you is I think very much a mindset of the artist and the entrepreneur. And you're walking me through these works where I've basically taken what's given and pulled them apart and rebuilt them differently. And it's funny to see that that um, gesture is there even in really you know much older sculptural works because this was a painting, a portrait of my mother and me and, and our dog. Um, and again, with permission, she gave it to me and I, and I took it apart and I made a book out of it so that you could only see this. <laughs> right. So that, like, this, and that's probably a much more accurate experience of our lives is that we don't really see the, the whole picture at once. We experience it in parts. Um, but it also gave me a sense of ownership over this moment of my own childhood to be able to say, like, OK, you took a picture of me and I'm going to I'm going to pull it apart and retell it and own it. I think that's really entrepreneurial, frankly, is to not take what's given. And it's also very I'm just going to say it out loud one more time. It's a mindset that's shared by both the entrepreneur and the artist in many cases to not simply accept what's given, but to interrogate it and to imagine alternatives. Oh my gosh. It gives me right? goosebumps. I love yeah. it. <laughs> it's, it's, um, something I have always really wanted to articulate, but you put the words to it in a way that just makes it so real. Um, so this one, I, I just, oh, I saw the book and I was like, that's so cool. That's so, so inventive. Yeah. Um, and then this one, um, oh. mm -hmm. wow. Like, Letitia's I, dad. Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah, Letitia's dad. Letitia Cuisin, um Berry is a, is a good friend and she was a Kentucky based artist. And um, my father had already passed away. And I think maybe we'd had a conversation about that. And she, she knew something of my work to date, but mostly she knew that I'd also lost my dad and, and her dad had passed away. And she sent me a box of his shirts. And there was a sweater in there too. And a, a letter that she'd written to me to, to understand a little bit more about her dad and about, and just a little bit from her perspective. I'm telling you, she's like, do what you want. And I thought, oh, that's such a responsibility, right? Yes. You gave me your dad's shirts and a sweater. And I sat with it for a year. They just sat in a box for a year. And I had to let go of the feeling that I needed to deliver something. I mean, that's another thing is you want to work with people who, who are okay with your process. And so she didn't, there was never any pressure. Um, and it finally dawned on me that I would make one small shirt. So these are both that sweater and those, that shirt are about this big. But it's a, you know, when, you know, when you, you know, memory sort of recedes, you, you have a sense of your father in my case, and yes. it becomes a sort of, you know, it's, it's grief, grief, and it's a, it's a terrible thing, but it's also a natural thing that they, that they start to seem farther and farther away from you. So this idea of making something diminutive and dear, again, here's that sort of little sweater hug gesture, right? Um, and at the same time, the sense that it's time to archive and that someone's moved uh, into a place of memory. So I took apart the sweater and I took that yarn and I knit a small version of her father's sweater. And um, I made one small shirt out of many shirts. Um, and then I transcribed part of her letter about her dad um, and enlarged that. And so it's sort of, it's a triptych. It's a portrait of, it's a portrait, not just of her father, but of, of Letitia's love for her dad too. So. She gave two pieces, she kept one piece of the triptych and gave the other two to her mom. I can't remember how she split it up, but you know, like that's not, there's this idea that arts entrepreneurship is about commercializing art products. And I really resist that. I think that's like saying that art is painting. That's one, that's one potential pathway, but I would never make work like this to sell it. It, it has no, there's not a commercialization factor to it. So I think, um, they don't have to necessarily like business entrepreneurship and art entrepreneurship are not necessarily the same thing. And um, not all artwork has to be a 
product that goes out into the world um, that, right. that generates, you know, a monetary value for its maker. There's, there's also an essay, right, that's being written over decades, a sort of trying to understand the world that we inhabit. Um, a different kind of value, right? I think we talk we talk a lot about that in arts entrepreneurship is value. Like what, how are you defining value? What is your return on investment? My return on a year's investment in this project is not a sale price, right? Right. It was, oh, it was both giving something, but also understanding a piece of a puzzle for myself. I'm so glad you like that one. It, I, I love, I mean, you've mentioned the word story and I'm so drawn to the story of everything. Like, I yeah. think you can even reflect, it's kind of funny, I noticed like in previous interviews, we didn't even have the screen sharing, right? Like, it's really great now that we get to actually look at the work, but like, what does it say about me that I didn't even think about that? Like, I wanted to know why the person did it more than I even needed to, like, I just wanted to be inside their head more than even on yeah. the paper. And I think that that- well, look at your discipline. It makes sense that you would want to be inside someone's head. <laughs> yeah, that's starting to, right. starting to add up. What's your, what's your basic impulse? Who are you? Right. Let's go for, let's build from there. Who are you? That is a good starting point for yes. anything. Yes. And so I'll stop screen sharing. You talked a little bit about right. value and discussing that in your courses. And I, um, I do want to understand um, what you prioritize in your, your teaching and what skills you do want students to walk away with, whether they're about value or more broadly. And um, I, I wish I could be in your classroom. I actually know a few people who are in your classes right now. Yeah. I'm like I'm so jealous. Yeah, well, I'm my class. <laughs> you know, my class right now. Um, the uh, I think it's it's the most important question, right? If you're teaching, the most important question is what are you hoping the takeaway is for people in the classroom, and um, and the classroom for me is really broad. You want to see where I am right now? I would love that. Mind? Okay, so um, I apologize now for any dizziness that I create. I'm in the um, arts entrepreneurship space that is, it, it came online, I'll back up here so you can see the library. Yes. It came online um, a year ago and then immediately was shut down by COVID. So it's just now coming back online um, as a project space and a gathering space. Um, I'll take you outside so you can get us. Wait, I got a mask up. Hold on. Got to do the right thing. Yes. Uh, I love it. Over here is the um, Center for Photographers of Color, Sugar Gallery, and the Arts Entrepreneurship Space. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. Yeah. It's good, right? oh, a little that's wobbly. Cool. So the um, the purple lights are. The very first stage of hold on, got to keep my angle right. The very first stage <laughs> of balancing everything. This is a micro farm that um, the special projects team is developing. I'm gonna shut the door so I can take my mask off. Um, special projects team that came up through arts entrepreneurship last semester. I'll tell. I'm gonna. I feel like my. I feel like my pilot. I don't. I need a pilot's license to do that. <laughs> But they, um, they are developing a project this semester that's going to be the purple lights at the beginning of a micro farm. And they're gonna be developing microgreens and little, um, I can't wait to see what mushrooms they grow. And they've just been invited by uh, Bernice and Brian Hembry of Roots Festival to take those boutique yields and um, contribute them to the Roots Festival uh, sort of special weekend um, chef music events over the summer. So that's going to be interesting and to see how it goes. So, so the question is like, what is this, what do students take out of, out of an arts entrepreneurship class? Well, um, we start with trying to get really close to who you are. And in a class of 15, that's 15 different close to who you are. Um, and then to think about what your assets are personally, but also the assets of relationship. Who do you know? Who can you work with? And how do you keep those things moving together? Who you are, what you have, who you know, um, actually pretty strong effectual principles, by the way, in order to start to develop something um, that couldn't possibly live in, could possibly live in the world. Um, so those are the mechanisms. What that really looks like has everything to do with who's participating in them. So this is a group of four people that have an interest in, uh, um, their interests overlay and so they're forming a really effective team 
and they're going to develop this micro farm and they're also up on Mount Sequoia developing a day studio to put artists in residence over the summer. Right. That's what they wanted to do. So we figured out how to do it. And, you know, along the way, you have to shed some of the things that you want that you realize there's not an audience giving you permission, right, to bring that into their lives. Yeah. And so you, you think, okay, well, that's something I want, but I, I can't quite see the other, I can't see anybody else wanting it yet. And so, you know, there's a relationship between what you're making and, um, and, it's, a, and it's right to live in the world. I had a sculpture professor when I was an undergrad who was, she was sort of mean, but <laughs> she said to us, she's like, um, why does what you make have a right to exist in the world? Right, which is, it's too brutal for a first year sculpture person, but she meant literally you're making a thing in the world and we have a lot of things in the world. So you have to, you have to act with accountability as you put things into the world. You have to think about, is this just me expressing myself or is it an expression of connections or um, insights that, that catch and have value for other people? This is something artists do anyway and then it's also, if I were talking to an entrepreneur, it would make perfect sense. If, you know, if I was talking to a business entrepreneur, that everything I just said would make sense to them too. What I think is interesting though, um, and it, this might be a, a point of personal, like me needing to grow. And so I'm gonna just vulnerably ask it. Like um, part of, I think entrepreneurship is when you have a vision for something before maybe it's like, before people know the value that it could add, right? Like I think of some artists who were, maybe appreciated after their time and they created things when they didn't necessarily have permission. Like, I wonder how you balance those two things because um, sometimes I feel like we're in spaces where we can so clearly see that this thing needs to happen, but everyone else is like, that makes no sense. It has no value. We're not doing it. And I think like sometimes maybe if you find like a way to um, uplift and do so with like respect for other people's ideas, like in experiencing it, they get to have the same vision that you do. But I don't know how that aligns to the permission whole like mindset. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, of course it makes perfect sense. Um, I had seven, again, I had seven or eight thoughts while you were talking. One of, one of the things we find is that um, there's a tipping point, right? You can be too soon to something, or you realize that you're not too soon, but your audience is gonna be much smaller than somebody else's because your audience is going to be highly attuned to some of the things that you're engaging. So they're gonna be able to read and understand what you're talking about and what you're working on in a way that a broader mass audience might not. So I think there's this moment, I was talking to a grad student last year um, who was going up for candidacy and he was talking about how wanting people to understand the work. And I said, I said how many people is it 10 million people, a million? Would you be happy if 10,000 people understood what you're working on? Or what about a thousand? Lucas Spivey um, is a friend, he, he founded and runs Culture Hustlers and he has an exercise that's a thousand true fans, right? Like how big does your market have to be? These ideas of scale are tied to this idea of um, relevance. Just it's not less relevant because it has a smaller audience. Yes. Right? And I think if you sort of figure out which game you wanna be in, sometimes a small audience is actually a game of great influence. You can, we think influence is a giant audience, but sometimes it's a small audience that then ripple affects what it is that you're engaged in and what you're engaging in with them. Something else that occurred to me as you were speaking is that we have this cult of individuality that we really suffer from. Yeah. And um, this idea that somehow the idea starts with me and then I need to get into the world and the world understands it or doesn't is, is kind of a fallacy because there's actually a network of people who have to understand it together. And then they try to bring it into existence beyond the closed quarters of that, whatever the studio or whatever the, the firm, whatever it is. And then it goes out for reinvention. Invention doesn't end with the making of the thing. It continues in relationship to potential audiences. It develops and changes over time in relationship to others. So if we think it's like, I invented it, and engineers have this problem too. I've coached a lot of engineers right? in the more traditional entrepreneurial space where you're like going for investment or trying to you know, discover your, your customer segment. 
there's a, a tendency to hold on to the invention as though it's perfect now. I just need to sell it or I need to find out. I need to make people understand it. When in fact, the entrepreneurial process is one in which your thing improves because you start to let go a little bit yes. and you allow it to be informed by potential users and you figure out who the user might be, right? Or you you move around. But, I, you know, it, it's a complexity. It's not just, I had a great idea and the world couldn't recognize it. Well, why didn't the world recognize it? What is it? Is it their fault? Is it my fault? Is it right? You know what, I mean? what are the actual dynamics there? It's um, it's much closer to living a life than it is to um, you know, writing a formula. Yes, that makes so much sense, or it's starting to make more sense. And I think it's just um, the expansiveness of like that entrepreneurial mindset um, is so valuable, and and it, it does bring you in community with other people as you're like not hoarding your idea, but sharing it and letting other people add to it um, because of all the, the unique value that they bring. Um, so I think that's really special. Yeah, let your audience do some of the work. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, so I, one other thing with your, your classes, you, um, you know, they are at this intersection of art and entrepreneurship and business. In social work, when we enter our um, practice settings for the first time, we talk a lot about imposter syndrome and feeling mm -hmm. like, like, how could I possibly like deserve to be or be trusted with this? I wonder if that affects people when they see your course, like before they sign up, like I'm not an artist, I'm not a business student, or, you know, like I am an artist, but I don't know anything about entrepreneurship. And I feel like entrepreneurship is a businessy thing. Like, do you have an encouragement for students there? Or can you say something about what the actual like prerequisites, if there are any would be? Um, so there are different levels of, of, of coursework, of course. So um, the most basic so let's talk about what we just talked about which is the willingness to let go of your starting point if you come into arts entrepreneurship here um, it's the very it's the entry it's an entry level course but it asks everyone to let go of what they think they know about entrepreneurship because again is it mona lisa and dollar signs is that what we think arts entrepreneurship is that would be very that would that's an impoverished viewpoint of what arts entrepreneurship it's not just art plus money that's there's plenty of that it's it's a creative practice and it's a creative practice with an expanded set of tools and if we just start there that's a great starting point i mean anybody can enter into a space where that's just a mindset after that arts entrepreneurship asks you to get very um real about who you are if we're not beginning from a place of authenticity, um, I think this is something that puts me off sometimes about traditional, you know, I mean, the shark tank kind of, mm -hmm. right? Like, ugh, <laughs> ugh. Um, ugh. who wants, who wants, ugh. Um, <laughs> it's such a, it's such a cliche, but if we, um, if we think about if, you know, there's a difference I think between the, this is like our, this is for our second hour, I think, but there's a lot, there's a really big difference in the motivations between many an entrepreneur versus many an investor. And some entrepreneurs are investors and some are creatives who are working on something um, that they, well, let me go back, let me go back. Um, the, the real point of what I was trying to get at is that if, if it's not an authentic extension of yourself, um, I think it can get away from you really quickly. And if you're not starting from a place of authenticity, meaning knowing yourself, being self-aware and um, not, I think you can you can somehow be like, oh, I'm gonna change it because it's gonna please this audience or that audience. Oh, wait, oh. And all of a sudden you have nothing because you've tried to please too many people and you've lost track of a, of a, of a really good North Star, which is, do I care about this? So we have to start by getting close to what we all individually care about. And then we can move into trying to figure out what other people might care about too. And that, that intersection is where things can catch in the world and have a chance to, to take root out there. So the, the micro farm could be the idea of somebody who just loves to garden. Mm -hmm. But when you start to understand how micro yields of mushrooms and, um, and greens 
actually make sense and to, to Roots Festival, all of a sudden you've sort of moved from just an, a place of authenticity, but now into also a space of understanding what other people might be able to use or need or want. And so you get to keep doing it, right? Once you connect, you get to keep doing it. So I think it's, I think arts entrepreneurship is about messing around in those mechanisms and um, and just arriving at just growing. Just if you just grow a little bit and in, in over if you grow in your classes over the course of a semester, even just a little bit, that's a good class. What a great place to start. I feel like that's valuable, regardless of whether you're going to go into, you know, regardless of what you go into, it's just an important frame of mind to have of growing and knowing who you are. I think you I think you asked a really good question about what what happens if you're intimidated by either side of that equation, especially because one of my loves is putting students from different different disciplines into the same space together. Mm -hmm. And I found that um, in the space of arts integration, you can put art into things, you can put things into art, but you can also put people into the same space and allow them to um, share out the methods that they themselves are learning from their different um, disciplines. So, you know, a, a sophomore in management isn't an expert in management. A sophomore in ceramics is not an expert in ceramics, but they're absorbing. And if you put them together, it's really interesting to think about what they might come up with in tandem. So I, I guess I don't know what to say about intimidation because if you're an artist or an entrepreneur in your core, you might, you might be intimidated, but it never stops you from moving forward and trying something out. So I think another, another element would be um, taking a risk. Taking a risk that something might not work out, but that there was some gain from the experience. I think I hope that's something that happens in, a, in, a, in my classes too. Yeah, it's a good question. It's just such, I'm going to think about it all day long because <laughs> we can lower the barriers so that people come into that space. Anyway, I'm actively thinking about it, how to teach across across the School of Art and College of Business, you know, how to put, and some people get it and some people don't. And it's not that they're never going to get it. It's up to me to create an environment and where people can see the connections and you, okay, I'm done. No, I'm just, I mean, I'm excited to see how you keep thinking about it, how this space keeps evolving. Um, and I think everything you said was really rich with wisdom. Anyways, um, so on a, a final wait, note. Wait, wait, I want to say one thing. I want to say one thing, which is rich with wisdom is rich with lots of knowledge gained through failure over many years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, and that's a great context for people who are, are nervous. Like, you know, like we're meant to learn, like we're meant to, we're meant to come into things where we. You know how you like the Mad Men story? Yes. There's another one I tell a lot that makes me feel better and I hope it makes you feel better. And that is, there was an interview I read a long, 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 long time ago with a set with the casting directors, a team of casting directors. So they have a, a movie script. They're trying to get the actors that are right for it. They do these open calls, however that works. It's not my field, but we, we know what it looks like, right? They're like next. And then they said, you know, everyone who comes up to read or audition, they think that our job is to keep them out. But we're hoping every time that that's the person that we're done, for the, we can stop. We've found the person. The people you think that are trying to keep you out are often just hoping they're rooting for you. And if you can flip that perspective, you know what I mean? Like, what if that person is actually rooting for me, not, not trying to gatekeep? I think our gatekeepers need to root for the people that are trying to, to, to cross those thresholds. Yeah, teachers should root for students, right? I think most of us do. It's um, I don't, I actually don't know if it's really, but I see a connection, so I'm gonna share it with you because I feel like you might Please. appreciate it. <laughs> um, so when I was applying to grad school, um, you know, I had I'd been out of school for a while. There was this application. It took me months. Like I spent so much time writing this application, and there were days where I was like, "This is such a waste of my time." Like I think this is so frivolous. Like, but um, it it really is about that perspective shift. Because then I was driving one day. And I was thinking about how I was going to go home after my grocery shopping. It was a Sunday. I was going to, you know, make a little bit more progress. And I was like, wow, like this is actually letting me think about why I want to do this. Like if at the end of this, I don't want to go to the school, then I won't submit it. But like, it's giving me a space right. to have that dialogue with myself about why this matters to me and what I want to learn from it. So that when I'm in that space, I can say those things. Exactly. So if I didn't have this like dedicated time for that, yeah. they would not be allowing me to make a thoughtful decision. And right. that was like just astronomically helpful in getting me to actually do the work and like have a yeah. little bit there was still a lot of anxiety because that's just who I am but 
there was a lot more joy <laughs> that was added to it. There's something else to that story, which is that you were driving when you had the insight. Mm. And so much of insight happens when we put the work aside, put it to the periphery and let it just kind of like hold. We don't stop working on it, but we need to switch our contexts in order to have fresh insights about what we were working on. It's another argument for the interdisciplinary space. I'm going to see this through a different set of eyes. It's going to move to the periphery for a moment. I think that's one of the, I think it's really interesting that you were on the drive when you, when you sort of saw, had a moment away from it to see it clearly. Those drives, the exercise classes, the everything for me, like those are the spaces where the, the idea. The periphery. the periphery is a really interesting space, but you're absolutely right. You had to um, process it to understand its value or to, to be able to think it through. It's why you don't just get the, uh, the corner office, right? <laughs> like, oh no, wait, maybe, you, maybe there's a few steps before, cause that might not be the right, that might not be where you wanna be. So right. why don't you like chop wood and carry water a little bit before you- right. And it's not because they're keeping it from you. And that's right. so important to the point right. of casting. Thank because you. No one's Hopefully. holding it from you. They want right. you to be where you're meant to be, but you yeah. don't know yet. <laughs> and you're still- You don't that. know yet. And that's I think great. that's, it's so exciting. Um, <laughs> Adrian, I'd love to, like, well, I, it's yeah. just been a joy all around. I'm so excited to keep, I hope, being part of your life and this work, but I want to know what you want people to leave knowing about you and about this work that you're doing. Um, um, you know, I, there's so much pressure to land, to get it right, to succeed, to make a mark, all these things. Um, and I think ambition is really important, but it's all process, right? It's all process. So I think jump into it, whatever it is, get messy, get dirty, treat people right, treat yourself right. Um, and see what, see what comes of it. This idea, I, you can tell already from the conversations that we have that I'm much more interested in, in effectuation than I am as in causation. I'm more interested in what we might do with what goes wrong than in avoiding the possibility that anything could go wrong. And I think that that's not a bad way to live your life. I mean, by all means, you know, learn how to drive before you get in a car. But <laughs> There's some little things where that's like a little helpful, but. Yeah, but allow room for accidents, allow room for mistakes, allow rooms for um, other people to, to bring things into your experience in your life. That's maybe too big. That's not like an arts entrepreneurship piece of advice, but I, I, I do think that there are parallels between that kind of a mindset and the ability to really um, have a career or pathway that's in art or entrepreneurship. Yes. What and advice do you have? <laughs> oh my gosh, what advice do I have? This is, you're catching me off guard. Uh, no, <laughs> I think, um, you know, I, I love the idea of having space to get things wrong. And I think for me, what's really important in that is that I can be transparent with people that I'm getting it wrong. Like I don't set myself up to, for people to think I'm gonna do it perfectly. I set yeah. them up to know that I'm gonna be truthful with them in the whole process, yeah. that I'm gonna be communicative and that like, if I file, like I'm gonna do so as respectfully as I can. And I'm gonna let them know at the forefront that it's not a reflection of how I care about them or anything else other than that I'm learning. And I think that makes me feel less worried about you know, of making a mistake that hurts someone because that's the part of thing that keeps me from from doing things that are are bolder is just because I don't I don't want to hurt people. I don't want to do it wrong. I don't want them to be mad at me. But if you say at the forefront your intentions and you let people know that it might not be perfect, for me yeah. that's really freeing. Yeah. And the bigger picture there is um do your best to be trustworthy. I mean that goes that goes a long way, doesn't it? Yeah, that's beautiful. That's exactly right. Um, and in the in the willingness to to be wrong, we actually get closer to some semblance of being right. And closer to the people because I think uh, we don't, we put up less walls and they get to know who we are and what we're like worried about. And it's just uh, it's yeah. it's really special. Yeah, control is an illusion. <laughs> And we should have learned that in this past year, I think. Holy cow. <laughs> Holy cow. It's an illusion. So, you know, and, and maybe one other thing is that when you're wrong, say you're sorry. Just do it fast. Rip that Band-Aid off. Yes. Oh, my gosh. It's it's so it means so much 
um, to everyone when we get to Yeah, all that advice is advice I'm giving myself every day. <laughs> yep, it's gonna help me even going into this afternoon. It's just always gonna be relevant. Um, Adrian, thank you so much for taking the time. I'm thank you. so excited um, for everything that's to come. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to sharing this with everyone. It's always good to spend time with a New Yorker. <laughs> so <laughs> true. <laughs>